shring ka e i la ring asa ka la ring sa ka la ring sa hoin kling ring shring namaste so so far we've been through parvati approaching shiva and first she addresses him in a prayer that's just wonderful one of the most devotional prayers i've ever heard and then she begins to run down the situation the fact that we find ourselves in kali yuga the most degraded age huh? and it's only the beginning <laughs> it hasn't even really got going yet there are still vestiges of the previous instructions the previous religious culture that was given in india through the vedas and so on but they're disappearing fast so she asks shiva then if those old religious teachings aren't working anymore what special dispensation do you give for men in the age of kali so that they can attain the highest despite the different ills of the age and so she's been leading up to this great question and now she's finally going to ask it here it is say o lord of the distressed in thy mercy how men may obtain longevity health and energy increase of strength and courage learning intelligence and happiness without great pains and how they may become great in strength and valor pure of heart obedient to parents not seeking the love of others wives but devoted to their own mindful of the good of their neighbor reverent to the devas and to their gurus cherishers of their children and kinsmen possessing the knowledge of brahman learned in the lore of and ever meditating on brahman say o oh lord for the good of the world what men should or should not do according to their different castes and stages of life for who but thee is their protector in all the three worlds what a wonderful question what a powerful question you know there are many questions like this that come up in the course of spiritual life big questions how do we get the answers to these questions this was the query that came up the topic that came up exactly this topic when i had resigned from being guru in the past about 10 years ago and i was searching for a new direction a new way to experience spiritual life i was seeing the uh, shortcomings of faith-based hierarchical patriarchal religion and i had made the determination that what we really need is an experience-based phenomenological uh, practical religion that's visible and, and realizable here and now not after death not in the next life but right here right now and I got some very good advice from Werner Erhard which is just stand in the question in other words, don't look for an answer. Be the question. And the answer will come. And it did. <laughs> so that's why we're here today. So that's the end of the first chapter, which is called The First Joyful Message. And now we begin the second chapter, Introduction to the Worship of Brahman. Hearing the words of the Devi. Shankara, 
bestower of happiness on the world, the great ocean of mercy, thus spoke of the truth of things. Sadashiva said, O oh, exalted and holy one, benefactress of the universe, well has it been asked by thee. By none has such an auspicious question been asked aforetime. So you see, this is the role of the Universal Mother. The Universal Mother approaches the Universal Father and she asks for wisdom to benefit all of the living entities who are all her children. See, she asks because she's interested in our welfare. She wants us to make it. She wants us to be happy. So she asks for the greatest wisdom, even though actually she already knows it. Huh? She is also omniscient, <laughs> being the feminine part of the Godhead. But in order to show the proper way of receiving knowledge, huh, is, which is given in the word Upanishad, Upanishad means come close, sit down and listen. <laughs> so we should approach a guru, we should approach someone who knows, uh, someone who's realized, not just theoretical knowledge, that's vidya, but jnana, jnana means realized knowledge, direct knowledge, prakash, directly seen, and that will have good results. So then Shiva continues, Worthy of all thanks art thou, who knoweth all good, benefactress of all born in this age. O gentle one, thou art omniscient. Thou knowest the past, present, and future, and the Dharma. What thou hast said about the past, present, and future, and indeed all things, is in accordance with Dharma, and is the truth, and is without a doubt accepted by me. O Sureshwari, I say unto you most truly and without doubt that men, whether they be of the twice-born or other castes, afflicted as they are by this sinful age, and unable to distinguish the pure from the impure, will not obtain purity or the success of their desired ends by the Vedic ritual or that prescribed by the Sangitas and Smritis. Whoa, this is a big pronouncement. He's basically saying that the religious principles that were designed for the previous ages don't work in this age. It's not that there's anything wrong with those religious principles, but we aren't pure enough to follow them. So because of that, he needs to give a new dispensation. He needs to give a new holy book, a new spiritual reference for the Kali Yuga. So what is that? Verily, verily, and yet again verily, I say unto you that in this age there is no way to liberation but that proclaimed by the Agama. I, O blissful one, have already foretold in the Vedas, Smritis, and Puranas that in this age the wise shall worship after the doctrine of the Agamas. Now this is a big deal. If something is repeated three times in the Vedic literature, then it is taken as an absolute truth, incontrovertible, uh, non-debatable, uh, perfect and very important instruction. So here he's going, verily, verily, and yet again, verily. In other words, this must not be doubted that the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Puranas, uh, all these books gave religious principles for a previous age and that therefore they're unsuitable 
for this age. And we've seen this, huh? Especially here in India. There are many people clinging to the old ways. And, and this is good in a way because it lets us know what they are. Uh, but recently, within the last 50 or 60 years, all the great realized souls who exemplified those principles have left the planet. Ramana Maharshi, Chandrasekhar Indra Saraswati, my Buddhist teacher, Jnananda. Huh? All those realized beings have left. They were following the old ways and they reached success. But most people in this age cannot follow that path. And the proof is that these great teachers have very few, if any, students and followers who reach the same level of enlightenment. Actually, I don't know of any. So this is the age of the, uh, the fallen. This is the age of the untruth. This is the age of the rogues and the cheaters. And we see in the society, they become very prominent, but the honest people are suppressed. Huh? So what we need is a different religious system that does not count on hierarchy, that does not count on patriarchy, that does not uh, require some special arrangements outside of what is available in ordinary life. Mm -hmm. Like special, I talked last time about the special arrangements for the Vedic fire ceremonies. They're so elaborate and they require so much wealth. They're out of reach for the average person. But what is an ordinary person to do? What is the Dharma that will work for ordinary people in this age of Kali? Okay, that's what Shiva is addressing. Verily, verily, and beyond all doubt, I say to you that there is no liberation for him in this age. Heedless of such doctrine follows another. There is no Lord but I in this world, and I alone am he who is spoken of in the Vedas, Puranas, Smritis, and Sangitas. The Vedas and Puranas proclaim me to be the cause of the purity of the three worlds, and they who are averse to my doctrine are unbelievers and sinners, as great as those who slay a Brahmana. Therefore, O Devi, the worship of him who heeds not my precepts is fruitless, and moreover, such a one goes to hell. The fool who would follow other doctrine, heedless of mine, is as great a sinner as the slayer of a brahmana or of a woman or a parasite. Have no doubt about that. So he's saying not only are these old obsolete religious forms and practices uh, ineff ineffective in this age, but that one actually commits a sin by following them and falls down. We've seen this. Huh? We've seen it time and time again. In my time in India, I've seen so many temples, so many masters, so many sannyasis, so many gurus who uh, made the pretension, they pretended to follow the old ways externally, but in their personal and private life, they were just like everybody else in Kali. Huh? So many gurus, and they talk about so many high transcendental things, right? But they uh, are having sexual affairs. Uh, they're eating this and they're drinking that. <laughs> and of course, they become polluted by that. And then they fall down. So why, why intentionally sign up for a path that exposes you to the danger of falling down? Huh? You know, it's like these people who do parkour 
and, and like leap from one building to another, a high building, you know, hundreds of feet off the ground, you know. Why would you take that kind of a risk? It's crazy, you know, unless you're some kind of adrenaline junkie, which I guess they are. The point is, why would you sign up for a religious process that includes the danger of falling down and going to hell? Because that's what all these old books say. If you don't follow this, if you're not able to maintain celibacy, if you're not able to maintain pure vegetarian diet, and so on and so on and so on, you fail. You won't be able to get the enlightenment. Why would you sign up for that in an age where it's already so difficult? Huh? It's already so hard to follow any kind of religious principles. See, in the old days, people lived a religious life, a spiritual life, naturally. They simply took whatever they were doing and offered that as service to the Supreme Godhead, Brahman. But in this age, people's lives, their ordinary life, their household life, their professional life, everything they do is covered with some kind of fault. Huh? There's no purity in this age. So why pretend? Why make believe that you're pure when you're not? And you can't be. Huh? Sex is the best example because everybody likes sex. Sex is very beautiful. Huh? It's a little taste of nirvana for a few seconds. <laughs> but then... Because of the nonsense that, that people do around sex, all the, all the lies and the deceit and the, you know, the nasty stuff that goes on around sex, it becomes sinful. But people pretend to be celibate, people pretend to be brahmacharis and sannyasis and like that. And they pretend to be religious teachers when really, they don't have any qualification because they don't understand what Shiva is saying here. That these old ways are obsolete, they're ineffective, they don't work, and they will lead you to commit sin and fall down. Now what is a sin? That you miss the opportunity to become enlightened. See, if you think sex is wrong, bad, a problem, or whatever. And then you build your whole identity around a religious path that, that preaches that. And you preach it to others, and you get them convinced to follow it too. But previous to being a preacher, you were just an ordinary person who has sex and developed the sex habit. You can't just stop that habit, and suddenly now you're pure. <laughs> it doesn't work. I know thousands of people in different yoga paths who struggle with their celibacy, thinking they have to be celibate or they're not going to be enlightened. And they can't be celibate. They just can't. If they try, they become neurotic, and we see many examples of that too. So what we need is a path, a spiritual path, that makes a sacrament of sex, a tantric path that allows sex, not only allows it, encourages it, and also teaches us a way to make it sacred, make it beautiful, make it pure. See, that's the only kind of religious path that can survive in the age of Kali, because you can't change human nature. Om Tatsat. Aung Harihi Aung, Buddha Saranath.